Oh yes. Hello. Hello. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you. Uh, we're waiting for a few people. Okay. Christian, do you have video? There you are. Christian in a dungeon. Yes. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Hello. You see me? Matt. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. No, man. Give me a sec. I think we'll wait. One one minute or two more. Jeff. Hello. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> I just realized I didn't have the meeting on my my phone, so I had to. Uh, I didn't have the app on my phone, so I had to download it. Okay. I, it took about uh, five seconds on this fast internet we have here. Nice. Have lab. Great. <laughs> Let's wait a couple of minutes. Well, Dingo, is your voice working? Not yet. Let's see if you can uh, fix it. Brian, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see, we've got uh, we are missing Paul. Six, seven, Paul, and Prince. Okay. Hey, people, let's do it. Let's do it. If uh, Paul and Prince join us, that's awesome. But um, let's get it started. So I'm even a, a little uneasy or anxious to see this because we are going to change the world. <laughs> no, this is, this is good. Um, so what I wanted to do today is just everybody meet and greet and share a couple of notes on who we are and what our, what our goals are for the apprenticeship. So for the next six months, we will be pretty much working together, collaborating and learning a lot of new things. So I look forward to learning so much from everyone. It's all about us doing it together as we collaboratively. And who do we have? Who just joined us? That's it. Us. Oh, there we are. Sorry, it's just me. Okay. I, I needed the, to use my cell phone. Okay. Yeah, go ahead with that. So, yeah. Um, don't have anything specific on the agenda. I just wanted to, to get everybody to meet together, and we'll definitely get rolling. I think it's, it's a busy time for all of us. Definitely here, we're preparing to get the site ready. So, Jeff in the center with a beard he's our site manager and definitely also a participant where we'll, we'll be learning uh, jeff will be learning with us <coughs> on all the cad and design and build so he's here already wes is here already too on site uh, um, but yeah 
pretty busy time. The, the thing right now is still, we're going to do a little sprint at the end of this month regarding the CE Go Home 2, which we still haven't finished. We've got the foundation sitting there. Uh, so a lot of things happening before that. And still actually keeping the, uh, I think what we'll do is keep the mission open. So for people who want to join on a rolling basis still, we'll get going and we can still onboard people. Because I think this idea here of people uh, having the opportunity to do this full time and you know, as people become available or just find out about this, uh, it's definitely a good idea to get more people on board. So uh, if you know any people and got friends that are just keep, keep spreading the word, I think this is really cool. Like it's not something we really planned before this year, something that kind of emerged as in, a, in the nature of true collaboration. It's like uh, going back actually to my mentor, I, I should share a story. Uh, with my mentor, like when I, so I, I got a really cool mentor from TED, from the TED Fellows pro <coughs> program, his name is Steve, and <laughs> when we started working together, uh, one thing he pointed out, is like, so why are, why are you, you know, why, where's your team, or why are you doing a lot of this yourself, and it's like, okay, uh, how do we truly, truly collaborate, of course we're an open source project, we publish everything online, but there's a lot of different elements to, to open collaboration, and this is actually uh, the next step of it when we're it's basically kind of being vulnerable and saying okay let's do it together we don't have we don't have finished product as i mentioned to all of you it's like we're at a stage where anything can happen we can co-develop and it's co-developing is much better than uh working alone and that, and that's that's how we're coming into this program just to set set the expectation that we are cre all creating together and it's like certainly not about me it's certainly about a much bigger picture but it's about what we do and how do we see the benefit <clears throat> for all of us like how do we take ownership and, and create the things because it's all to be created there's so much opportunity as far as what can be done with the numerous proofs of concepts and all the experiments and everything we've learned over the last decade so it's a super exciting time. We can productize a lot of stuff and really gain traction, uh, economic traction, to actually change people's lives in a profound way. So I'm excited. I'm glad to have all of you here. So let's um, maybe um, maybe introduce each other, introduce ourselves. So yeah, maybe start with that and and share what what your biggest aspiration is for for the program um, who's that so I I'll start with myself so my biggest aspiration for this program JT Joshua Joshua hi okay great okay so we're still actually missing Paul and Prince so Joshua yeah. do you have video on you or <clears throat> yeah I'm actually still working right now as we okay speak so okay so just have to keep an eye on what's going on over there definitely so uh, I'll start with myself or what my I would like to see us do and that is uh, just very practically on the CE go home part if we can develop that to a super robust product that's extremely easy to build and solves a real need uh, it's a solid product release that can be built in hundreds or potentially thousands next year as we get this out to full product release with major major collaboration so starting with us but collaborating with the greater public we haven't yet really cracked and I don't think anyone in open hardware has really cracked how to get people to show up uh, and continue there by creating the financial feedback loops that's the critical part not really been done software's done it nobody really did with hardware in a way where the enterprise is being distributed. So this to me is a chance to show that people can show up, we can co-develop and get the best product out there and use it as a, as a way to bootstrap our project. Uh, and anyone else can do that. We're working for the whole world. Anyone can now take this revenue model and use it to support progressive work of their own, just like we want to do that here. So that's my hope after these six months that we've got something that shines and, and doesn't have any issues with marketability or, or getting out into the world. 
that it's excellent, easy to build, collaborative, absolutely open source, collaborative, no, never any compromise on that. So if we can do that as a team this uh, in the next six months, that's it. Because that product is, it's, it's there. We, we built it. We're, we're doing the second one. We're going to build two more at least during the next six months. Um, but then it's the question of, okay, here's the enterprise development that gets the traction out to the real world. And that's, that's the question. Uh, so I want to see that all of us uh, come together on that. Because the question is, it's like, yeah, we can definitely do it. In some way, we already have it, right? But the question is, how do we collaborate to make it excellent? How do we involve the whole world to make it excellent and beyond what anyone can imagine to transform the world? So get, getting a good example of a very solid product that can uh, scale wide, widely in a completely open collaborative way. It's not been done. I don't think uh, anyone can claim that yet for any open source product. 3D printing came close, um, not exactly, but uh, here's our chance. So that's my hopes for the next six months. Who wants to go next? <laughs> Jeff, why don't you tell us a little bit, bit about what your hopes are? <laughs> my immediate one or for the future? <laughs> for the next but, six months. <laughs> <laughs> my immediate one is that when we, <laughs> I'll be done with this project on <laughs> home. Now I'm getting, I'm getting hair blab clean right now, so getting ready for everybody to come in, give a, give you a good work environment. But for for the next six months. I'm really looking forward to working with all of you and developing the, the methods and techniques that we can show the world that this can be done and, and hopefully some of us will go out there and replicate it and, uh, and provide support to each other in the future, ongoing, so you're not left out there on an island by yourself as you're trying to figure things out. That's what we're trying to do here is trying to come up with the the plans, the methods, the techniques, the documentation, all of that, so that we can uh, publish this to the world and and we can see replication. So I'm looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Oh yeah. Um, I can I can go next. Um, so hey guys, I'm Wesley Barlow. Uh, I'm, I'm here at HabLab now. I came a little bit early. Um, mainly what I do is I'm a software developer and I, I make games. Uh, particularly, I'm uh, really good with Unreal Engine. Uh, my goals here are kind of to build like a, a next-gen um, architecture visualization of the CD Go Home and Unreal Engine 5 on Linux. And, you know, hopefully, um, I, I think if we have like a simulated environment uh, where some of these open source hardware models are, are more accessible both to learning and to, to using in different products, both physically building them and making them uh, uh, accessible to like game developers, um, just to improve the workflow uh, of people wanting to understand and, and create open source hardware. That's kind of uh, my goal and ultimately I think there's a lot of ways um, we can get funding around if, if we if we build um, like a simulator environment where uh, people have a more like visual connection to um, the different like CAD models and, and machines that OSC has prototyped. Oh. We talked about that as being potential training, like imagine you have a 3D game where you can take things, move things, identify th things, work as a massive multiplayer game, and you're actually building a thing. Could be a contest. If the game is good enough, if the content is there, you can record it, you can generate instructionals from that. That would be an amazing thing where you can take a lot of effort of people who are gaming and actually create real designs. Why not then take that and create other designs uh, effectively having a, a gaming architecture community if you have the modules that work that are proven engineering wise to make it happen. Extremely powerful. Okay. Keep going. Um, I can go next. So my name is Odundo. Um, 
uh, I guess I've been following OSC for around 10 years and uh, I guess I got really into it because I've been interested in economics. I actually studied economics at UMKC um, from a very heterodox approach. I got a little bit obsessed with intellectual property um, and I wanted to see some of those laws change. Um, I think this is a good um, way of going about that, um, just developing open source hardware. And so that's why I got involved. That's what I see myself contributing to. Mm -hmm. cool. okay. um, just one thing, if, can anybody else record this just in case my recording fails? Because this is history in the making. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I will be as open, so I'll, I'll do a screen capture. Go ahead, yeah. That'll be good. Multiple copies, welcome. Okay. Um, uh, my turn. Um, well, my name is Christian Ward. I come from Peru. And uh, basically, I'm uh, advocated in community development, in um, creating sustainable livelihoods. So more Recording people can, is on. So more people can access to this uh, this educational program, this uh, way of living, and uh, basically create change through OSC. I think um, uh, for me, well, I've been following open source ecology since a few years now, and it's uh, something that impacted me a lot. It created um, a mind shift that gave me the opportunity of uh, basically collaborating, collaborating with a lot of people in um, real lifetime uh, development that can create uh, a totally different world that can um, transcend, transcend and not just work for, for me or for a uh, few people, but uh, create the basis in which more people can access to this kind of education. So um, for me, the most important thing is learning, uh, as having a strong foundation on how to build uh, the machinery and, and um, how to create um, a, a solid um, col collaborated workflow. And, um, yeah, I have a very strong uh, commitment to it. I have people in, in, in my country that are willing to uh, step forward to do a community with me. So basically, it's um, it's something that I'm totally committed. I'm having a, a bit of challenges, for sure. Uh, going to the US is the first one and staying there uh, for the six months, I don't think it's gonna be possible, so I'm gonna have to split the program. But I think it's uh, a life, um, lifetime work. It's not just this six months and then forget about it. It's something that it's gonna, we're gonna have to build it uh, little by little and uh, bunch of, from bunches and uh, bites, right? So I'm very happy to meet you all. And um, yeah, so thank you. Thanks, Christian. Oh. Oh. Ah, we should go next. Uh, should I go next? Please. I'll go next. Ken. Hi, uh, my name is Ken and I, um, I actually come from Botswana, but I live in Indonesia at the moment. Um, I, I used to be an aircraft engineer. <laughs> I lost my job because of uh, COVID. So, but I've actually been following um, OSC since 2018. I've always had an interest in um, building with uh, compressed earth blocks. I had uh, my own two machines which I got from China, although I never actually got to use them. Um, so my interest is, um, I think, in the second week where we do the CB press build. So I'm really looking forward to that. And um, one other thing that I would like to see come out of the, the six-month program is, is actually the, the um, the financial side. I mean, I think we have to. <coughs> excuse me. 
I think we have to find a way or to um, how can I put it um, to build a company to actually show to the world that this actually works and you can actually make a living from it so um, I would like to see us be able to start a company that will actually uh, a viable company that will actually make um, make make money that can be reinvested into uh, you know growing the company and other businesses yeah thanks nice that's it economic feedback loops okay who wants to go next uh, i can go next can everyone hear me yes oh. so i'm i'm joshua um i've worked it for about 10 years now uh, still in this field i'm leaving my new job to come in work on OSE's project, so uh, that's going to be pretty interesting, but, uh, you know, OSE, as soon as I saw it, I knew it would be something that um, would be, that eventually has to be successful just because it's, this is the direction we have to go in to really kind of take back some of the freedom that we've, that we've lost, or to try to understand better the world we're working at. I think everyone's kind of, you know, focused on their work and they're pushed away from the, the actual involvement in their life for the most part. So uh, I think with, with this project, hopefully we can show that it is possible to work collaboratively and, and still everyone be successful and to show people that it's possible to be uh, more self-sufficient, to do some of these things on their own that'll eventually give them back more of their, their freedom and liberty. Basically because of the knowledge that they have. Um, for me, same thing, uh, really just to hope to have a direction, a business plan. Uh, one thing I really want to see is an eco-village or an intentional community started around, you know, the, the high-tech OSE brand. Uh, you know, I think it's really important that people get out of the work life cycle in order to be able to do things like this. Like, you know, I... I Go and explain, and that's the first question I get asked: Is well, well you have enough money, right? You got yet saved. How are you going to get all this stuff? And then I would show them the Global Village Construction Center. And they're like, oh, so you do have the heavy duty equipment to do this? Like, it, well, it's it's there, but it still needs to be built, and there has to be people to go build it. So that's mm -hmm. that's what I'm taking upon myself. That's an accurate way to frame it. It's there. It needs to be built and put to real use. It's like it's all there. Right. You're just on the on the ground floor <laughs> pioneering. Just yeah. <laughs> well, I think that I'm. Wait, Matt hasn't gone, but I can go. Um, it's a real honor to meet all of you and uh, to see all of you. I'm. Oh, yeah. I've been in. I got to Kansas City just in time for COVID, um, <laughs> and I've been here and discovered that Marchin was an hour away uh, through like Facebook, and we knew some of the same people. And I mean, I'm my background is in impact investing and sort of social entrepreneurship and philanthropy. So I am really hoping. Uh, one thing I should say is that I have a small foundation, and so I have to work on that, and so I'm a little bit more part-time with the Open Source Ecology Apprenticeship, but I'll be there uh, one to two days a week, and also contributing a lot on, like, if we want to do some design cycles or hackathons around the business model and the financial piece, I can, I think that I, the work that I'm doing, it completely relates to what we're doing here and so if anything it'll I think support potentially uh, with you know potential grant opportunities or builds or any of that but um, I'm um, I'm I, I'm not I, I never really when I was younger I was more of a maker than I am at this age and so I'm excited to kind of get back into you know um, I'm, uh, you know, into kind of tinkering around. Wes, I was funny. I was just playing with uh, the Unreal Engine 
last night. So it's cool to know that you do that. Um, and uh, Odundo, I'm teaching a course at UMKC right now on social entrepreneurship. So we have that connection and we're going to try to get some of those students to come out. And um, I don't know, I, I do I do have some thoughts on the business model. We could jam on that. And um, I, um, I'm i excited to get to know. One of the, I'd say my goals is to learn everything I can about making stuff to uh, be a little bit more savvy and sort of if I have an idea of a device I want to make, I could actually do that. Um, mm -hmm. I think I can support the organization development in terms of the stage it's at, the infrastructure and the, the dollars it has, which would support all of us, I think, in you know having some cash flow. And the third is just tribe. I really am just been kind of here with my dog alone in Kansas City, and I, I think it'd be fun to just um, hang out and learn from you guys and work together, um, which fires all the dopamine, oxytocin, uh, happy chemicals is when you complete a task together with a group of people, that's like the most joyous thing you could possibly do with, uh, in life. So that's, uh, you wouldn't think it, but anyways, um, that's my two cents and I'm really happy to be here. And, um, I have a, a report out for March in, I can tell them later, but, um, Bob wants to come hang out and tell him who Bob here. is. So um, I've been working on my foundation. It's me and one of the world's leading architects, sustainable architects who created the LEED certification for buildings. He helped green the White House. He studied under Bucky Fuller um, and he's in Kansas City and he wants to come look at the eco design house and offer recommendations for upgrades. Uh, and he has a, a major firm in Kansas City, BNIM. Um, you probably heard of it. Aduna looks like he heard of it. They built like half the city, including the airport and the Nelson. And um, <laughs> so he's, you know, he's going to help us kind of, maybe he'll give us some ideas on how to make the eco home like, mainstream. And so he's, he's like in his 80s. We could use uh, that. So. Cool. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Man, this is all very exciting. Right. Yeah, I love hearing all this stuff. Um, I'm Matt. Uh, I live in Ithaca, New York. Um, and uh, I'm an organizational psychologist, which means uh, we focus on uh, things like productivity and uh, leadership. Actually, been working on some uh, online courses on those topics and, and uh, was a former psychology professor teaching leadership um, but left that uh, decided to get out of academia because I actually wanted to have more of an actual impact on the world and um, so uh, so we moved we're living in an intentional community here in Eco Village uh, which I love and, and we're um, in addition to my online course stuff uh, uh, my wife and I uh, started this nonprofit which is focused on on kind of a integrating, um, uh, what we call it a regenerative education, which focuses on self-directed learning or unschooling, regenerative agriculture, and what we're calling regenerative housing, which is very much in line with what, what OSC is doing. Uh, we knew that we wanted to be able to like build this like community built house where, where the kids and of all ages who are learning and, and want to get involved can like participate and learn how to have to actually do this but we didn't have a model for how to build it we just you know, we wanted to build a cool sustainable house uh, and then uh, a neighbor randomly like maybe a month or two ago um, asked me if I was familiar with OSC I was like what this is this is what this is what we wanted to do but but it's here look um, and even way way more you know um, because it extends so far beyond just building a house um, so so I just knew that it had to be uh, kind of a part of what, what we were doing so the long-term goal is, is to really integrate this with um, with our nonprofit in terms of kind of maker space and, and giving kids exposure and adults. Um, we do want it to be an intergenerational space, um, 
the opportunity to learn these sorts of things, um, to participate in, in you know, developing businesses and, and making those regenerative businesses, things that uh, support the, the community. Um, and then also, uh, we, we did just move a year ago to this uh, community. We're currently living in a camper uh, on, uh, on the, the little uh, land that, that we will eventually build on. So, uh, so I'd, I'd like the CD Eco Home to, to be um, what we build, hopefully. Um, so, uh, so maybe, I don't know, maybe next spring we can start building after, after I'm a master of the, <laughs> of the, of the system. But, um, but uh, I should say that um, I will be, um, for most of the six months, I'll be remote um, because I have two young kids that I basically take care, uh, you know, hang out with uh, uh, every afternoon. Um, but so my plan is, is in the mornings, I'll, I'll spend a few hours um, you know, doing the design stuff and, and you know, prototyping on my own 3D printer here and then uh, also be there for the, uh, the calls at night on the business side. And then in September, I'll come out for like two, two and three weeks uh, to participate in those builds uh, of the CD Go Home and the Greenhouse. So, so yeah, so I'm super excited to just be a part of all this and to hear about all the cool stuff that everyone is doing and wants to be doing. So. Excellent. Excellent. Where do we go from here? Well, I, I just wanted to name a couple, two more connections I forgot to say is Matt, my, the foundation name that we have is called the Foundation for Regeneration. And so we're super into Regen Ag. And then uh, Christian, um, I probably, uh, I did business in Peru, a bunch of business, like I could tell you so much about all the microfinance stuff we did in Peru. So I lived well, in- Well, it's awesome. Yeah. It's amazing. Like which uh, and which part, uh, the province or Lima? I was, I've been to Peru maybe like fifteen times, like uh, oh, oh. all across like Ica, oh. Tacna, and uh, oh, yeah. you know like, you know Arequipa and Lima and I mean, uh, um, hmm. all the we could talk about it, but yeah, I lived yeah, there. for sure. Well, wow, that's amazing. It's such hmm. a coincidence. I know more about Peru than I do about most countries. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and what can can you uh, talk a little bit about it? About your projects there in Peru? Um, it was it was my it was a long time ago. Whenever um, uh, Mahabi Yunus, I don't know if you heard about microfinance, but in Peru it was. I was in uh, working on an impact investing fund, mm-hmm. and so we were investing in. Uh, you probably know. Um, you probably recognize some of the organizations. Uh, where are you in Peru? Where am I now? Yeah. In Germany. Oh, you're in Germany. Yeah, yeah, but uh, basically uh, lending uh, money to the poor so they can have uh, agency capacity so they can develop their own. Um, yeah. Um, how do you say this? Um, uh, my, a business, merchandise, merchandise business, small businesses. Yeah. Yeah. So oh. uh, Caja, Caja Senor de Lorin, uh, Fonde Surco. Uh, I don't know if you recognize the uh, Caja Nuestra Gente, Confianza. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's um, amazing. Uh, Mi Banco, a little bit. Mm-hmm. We kind of met with them. Yeah, that's, uh, Financiera that's de Universal. Bigger. Right. Mi Banco. It's a uh, yeah. It's a strong one, right? It's basically in, in old Peru, right? Yeah, it's, uh, that was yeah. the bigger ones, yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah. I could name off like five more. Um, but, oh yeah, Alternative Financiera. I was in Chiclayo with uh, Chiclayo. Financiera Alternativa. Oh, that's amazing, man. Congrats. Oh, these, um, I don't know. It, it's old news at this point. What we're doing is the future. Sure, man. Um, and that's what I'm really interested in, is like how, what if they knew how to do what we're talking about? Yeah, yeah that's what I was saying. Like, uh, I, ca- I can't get a hold of Eunice myself. Uh, I'd try to get a connection. But if they could add the open source element to that, I mean, it's, it definitely is like a foreign word to them, it seems to me. Mm-hmm. Do you have connections to, to Eunice himself? Or like... Do you, do you see some potential for 
using working with microfinance or I, uh, I would say yes, but probably not yet. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I think I think I don't I don't have his phone number personally, but I um, I know a handful of people that do. Mm -hmm. I um, one of my mentors uh, wrote the Nobel Prize for proposals to nominate mm -hmm. him year after year until he actually got it. Mm -hmm. uh, he's sort of like the man behind the man. Uh, nice. And another one of my friends discovered him in um, the 1980s. Um, so there, there's plenty of connections to him, but yeah. they're so big now. And I mean, he's he's not even really in control of the concept. You know, it's like mm -hmm. it's gone beyond him. He's just like Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, you know, if you go to Peru and you talk to um, Confianza. That, you know that would be the person to talk to is like that um, doing trainings there you know like with these banks um, but I don't know I would I would want us to be a little bit more um, I think that we have some work to do to, in order to kind of advance the our own capacity yeah exactly I think uh, um, I think what what's really missing is uh, leadership in a sense people that are um, teaching and like know this this for, uh, by heart so they can uh, be that influence and, and, and become that um, uh, that bridge for open source to uh, um, like uh, extend different uh, places right yeah so it's about or people people showing up so how do we solve for that get more people into this program and make the program better how do we do that? Yeah. I just texted somebody saying, "Hey, I'm come hang out with me and this guy," and I sent him your TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, yeah. I think we gotta we gotta. I mean, I don't want to talk too much. I'll let maybe uh, Jeff and Joshua they're quiet. So. Yeah, I actually had a, a thought on that. Um, yeah. I think that. You really have to meet people where they are. Um, I think most people, day to day, they're worried about um, their finances. And so if we can just emphasize the business aspect and show them that they can make money doing this, um, that'll be a huge uh, motivation for them to show up. Yeah. One of, one of my dreams is to get OSC integrated with an existing system so that you could go to the community college and get a loan and take the OSC classes. And they actually count and have, um, you know, viability for transfer. Absolutely. Both within, the, within the system, yeah. But if, if nobody's buying the CD eco homes or the products that we have, then it's that is an issue. So we got to ramp that up. Yeah. So I mean, it's product, product. So it's bad. We'll solve the product, and then um, we can have an easy way. I think. Yeah. So that yeah. So that's where we have to combine all our forces to make sure that we can do that well, effectively. And I always like to say that you know we can do the. We can go out right now, say, build the C eco homes. But it's all, always about the improvement. How good do we make it? How efficient are the build techniques? And there's always ways to improve it, to, to do better features. Not like you want to do feature creep, but just take, take the known things and, and make them, take existing technology and make it accessible, um, just simply better through open source. Um, but that's the part that requires all that work. Like for you know, the last decade I've been at this, it was always about experimenting and saying, "Oh, is this possible?" And the answer is yes, it is absolutely possible. That is not the question anymore at all. So, so cost improvements and performance improvements from fifty to a thousand percent for take anything, and then it's time to take the next step, which is the enterprise development part, where you can actually start uh, taking that value back to grow what we're trying to do 
but it's a lot of work. Like the, for me, the big learning was, man, it is to develop the business side. That's that's a whole. Like I thought it used to be about technology. It is not. I mean, it's half of it. Uh, but then there's the other half, which uh, historically we've, we've neglected that. I, I didn't come from an enterprise background, but that's something that completely emerges as the, the absolute critical thing. Uh, I always talk now, it's, it's like, it's not a question of whether it succeeds or how it succeeds. It's do we have the entrepreneurial savvy to make it happen? And that's what we got to build up. Martin, are, are there any examples of like um, very successful enterprise open source hardware projects? There's Arduino is a great example of that. You can say that Prusa 3D printers is a great example of that, but none of them are distributive, i.e. intending to replicate that enterprise based on a core product to the rest of the world. And that is the critical missing link that we're trying to address. We're saying we're going to do it well. Arduino, Prusa 3D printers. Prusa is the largest, as far as I know, they, uh, a year or two ago they were making like 8,000 printers per month. And that started as an open source project. I wouldn't call it an open source centric company right now because they got their product, they got success, and now they're just trying to keep the business running is the best way I would describe that. So open source centrism is, I don't think it's there anymore. In fact, like if you look at one of their videos where they're showing how they produce the filament for their machines, it's grayed out, it's proprietary what they do, you know, that kind of stuff. So um, things like that happen, and it's very common. So right now we do have a company like Arduino, or you can call Prusa, or maybe some other ones, but not distributive. Not to the point that, okay, this is good. Now we can spread that to the world. The word we use is distributed market substitution, a product that simply gets better, and it becomes the dominant core, just like in software, uh, there's a core that everyone builds from. That's the open source economy. People not, not getting patents anymore, but contributing to a common core that everyone builds on and it becomes better. So that kind of a thing, no, cannot say, we have a good role model on that. So, uh, like, so we talk about like, let, let's maybe start with like currency, right? Uh, like, like it, it's at some point like we get to a place where people grow their own food, they own their own homes, and then currency is less of an issue because they have more freedom with their time. Um, but like, mm -hmm. to build a house, you know, you, we need to buy the raw materials, and the question is like, okay, like what what funding mechanism do we use? To buy the raw material, like for example, there's like um, FHA loans, or like there's cryptocurrency. There's like there's like trillions of dollars out there. Um, the, the question is just like, you know, which path do you take? How do you? And I'm not sure. So our typical, I got an immediate response to that, and it's that you don't need money. You need the things that money can buy. So for us, uh, you don't need. Uh, to go to Menards, you can build a sawmill to generate an industrial sawmill that generates lumber. You can build a brick machine that generates brick. You can do solar concrete production that generates concrete. You can have an induction furnace that generates steel from scrap. So And plastic 3D printing that you can build your plastic lumber for the entire house or the panel. So we always look at, let's go down to the technological recursion that allows us to make those products. So that's so the, that's the. Can we build the machines way. from like a junkyard? Can we go to a junkyard and just get a bunch of scrap metal and then? Well, like, the, it, are the machines themselves buildable from raw materials? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's exactly what we do. But we typically don't go to junkyards where you would have to. Uh, we typically start from stock steel materials or stock materials that are easy and replicable. Because in a junkyard, yeah, you can find that part once, but good luck trying to have anybody replicate. So we're, we're not exactly doing that. We are doing something that's super replicable, but then we have to think about, okay, universal sourcing. And the most universal way you can get to sourcing is you build the machines or build, get the sourcing yourself. So here we have, we have a gravel, it's called limestone. Well, bake that at 900 C and that's called concrete. So thinking that way. So we get abundant solar energy, we can convert it to any technology. That's the kind of way we think. Now to get there, of course, to the first full implementation is going to take some capital, right? But once you have that, you talk about the distributed economies that can 
truly make life better for everybody because we're throwing away the the planned obsolescence and the, the complete dependence on the system when people and enterprises build things to break. So we, we close that cycle immediately right there is like a 10x cost reduction. And then you build systems around uh, around ways to do this more effectively. Whoa. You just want to say hi. Whoa. <laughs> so let's so here's Katerina. Hi She's everyone. gonna be participating a bit. <laughs> Looking forward to meeting you. The ones so I haven't have met yet. Uh, oh, I was just going to come and say hi. You would like yeah. me to have a seat? Well, I would like you to say hi. And um, uh, we sh we all shared with each other what we'd like to see, or like basically who we are and what we'd like to see happen from the six months. So give us a little word of inspiration. Oh, no, I wasn't prepared for that. Well, <laughs> Katrina designs houses now. She used to do other stuff for a living. But uh, she came out here to the middle of nowhere and joined about five years ago or so. Over seven. Seven? No. Oh, wow. No, not seven. Six, maybe. Okay, six. So, mm -hmm. uh, share, so Katarina, just share with us briefly what what would be your ideal outcome of the six months. We talked about the enterprise being a, a critical part to scale this thing. But what do you see as the most important thing that could come out in the six months? What do you think? I think that the most important thing that could come out of the six months would be for us to actually form a team because um, so far we've been you know, collaborating with people here and there but there hasn't this cohesive um, team that just basically works on this full time or most of the time. So if we could, that, that would be the best thing that we could, I think we could achieve would be for you guys to, you know, um, find a way that is hopefully inspiring uh, to make a living for you and that helps other people and for all of us to basically have each other's back and collaborate um, and just form this a team. I don't know what else to call it. <laughs> is that is that correct? That is. Yeah? Okay. So this guy here, Jeff, he's staying on site. Uh, <laughs> maybe some other... <laughs> People will be staying on site, but we're basically getting ready to have the facility run year-round. We've never done that, really, yeah. uh, as far as year-round ongoing activity. And Christian, he's coming back probably in March, so he'll be here kind of when it's much more cold. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, building a team that's, it's effectively, like a, you know, it doesn't exist in the world. It's like the closest is a co-op, but there's no co-ops that are open source, open source distributed. So we're trying to create a different structure, innovate on that. And that's the biggest prize we could get out of this. Uh, create a new economic paradigm. I love it. Yeah. No. No. Okay. Um, yeah, and is there any feedback or? Does anyone have anything yeah. to ask no. Katerina at this time? As she she did a lot of the work on the design of the CD Go Home. It's kind of free free form. We don't have any specific agenda, but anything come up uh, that you guys want to know about the CD Go Home? So, ah, uh, Brian just said that Bob Berkabeel wants to help us make the house more mainstream. Okay, that'll be great. <laughs> Which would be pretty <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, yeah. Does anyone have any any questions about how about the way the CD go home works? Any any things on on that or? I have a question. I why why are there so many different wall modules? Uh, I think we can hear. Yeah. There's like uh, oh, yeah. there's like six. <laughs> the question is. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> why are there so many different wall modules? Why is there like 70 of them? <laughs> well, I can answer that. Uh, so if you're designing the wall modules to be built and assembled rapidly into place, uh, they're largely the same, but there might be clearly some differences, like there's a window, there's a door. But also look at some of the other details. If it's a wall module that includes some plumbing, it will be different. If it has electrical, the electrical wiring, you might have a wall, wall switch in one place, uh, an outlet on another. So it ends up that there's quite a bit of uh, uniqueness in them while the core is largely the same. So, but if you're building that, you can't just say, oh, this module is 
kind of like that one. No, you can't say that. You have to say, this is exactly what you build. What you build. This, these are the exact blueprints. So you need to pretty much break down the whole product into individual modules to make it happen. That's the way that you can so-called digitize this product. Otherwise, you're saying that, okay, here's an architect, they design this general thing, and now the builder kind of goes up to their imagination to build it, and they'll know how to build it. But the latter is not particularly efficient. They have to do figuring out on the fly, and, and things are not designed for optimal use of materials or workflows. They're just, we'll just pass it on to the next guy. So in order to avoid that, you have to get rigorous into the breakdown of the initial step so you can digitize it, you can make it digital. Eventually, we might be 3D printing these panels or whatever, or having a CNC sawmill cut all the parts for it, or routers make all the panels, or 3D printing, or a straw board, open source from the, s the grass <laughs> that's here. Um, <laughs> but the idea is that it's about uh, housing 2.0, the concept that, okay, now you're turning uh, this model of building, which can be inefficient and typically is, I mean, it typically is quite inefficient, and you're making it absolutely most efficient at every step of the way because you're simply planning it out. Uh, but that requires that you go to, to that explicit detail, and you do end up with a particular large number of modules, which some of them are going to be the same. Uh, for example, if you have a big, uh, you know, big row house, well, many of them are going to be the same because the same module goes into multiple houses. But depending on the configuration, like in a single house, yeah, there's going to be quite a bit, and it might be around 100. Well, right now, currently, we have 70 modules and probably 50 unique ones. But unique could be like, oh, I just have a wall switch here. This one has. That's what I was going to say. There, there, but there, there are layers, and there is a point <coughs> to which many modules are similar, and then a point at which you start to differ. So, for example, like you could take two or three modules, or even a larger number, in which the only difference is the cutoff for an outlet is in a different position. So you could build all of those three modules like the same way in the same way, and then only at the end do you start to diverge in terms of details, right? Exactly. And that's a challenge of modular breakdown. How exactly do you design that process to, to make the workflow doable by a large team? So for us right now, we built this house five days with 50 people. But imagine even getting more people. Build a village in a weekend or, you know, build crisis uh, response. Rebuild something in a rapid time. We have all, you know, all of us have our facilities worldwide. We can descend on a place where we just say, oh, we're going to build a new one next weekend, things like that. The, the scalability is pretty intense in terms of what can happen using these type of techniques. Jeff? Yeah, I've participated in church and day projects church where day. we have, we've done, well, I think I've been on five builds, if I remember right, where we, we built a complete church. It started off with the slab. The slab was already done ahead of time. The day before the walls were framed in about two to three hours. And then the day of the build, it was 24 to 26 hours from the, the time we started to the time it was completely done and they had church in it. On, they, the build was done on a Saturday. They had church in the building on Sunday morning. I myself, I, I participated in the plumbing because I worked for a plumbing company and it, we had 20 plumbers working on it and the plumbing was done in two hours. Complete, completely done, all the plumbing for the the whole building that it it was just amazing how quick things would go and you would have so many different layers we i've seen five layers of guys working one on the floor one above him one above him one on the ceiling one in the rafters one on the roof and all simultaneous just like clockwork and it, it comes together so if you get the systems worked out it is amazing how quickly. There's about 300 people on these builds, 250 to 250 to 300 people, but it can be pulled off very, very quickly. Yeah. And oh, this is nice. this is for a, a a building that houses a a hundred people. So I don't remember the dimensions, but it's a church that houses a hundred people. It had um, so it had an office. And then like a dressing room and a baptistry and then the rostrum and then seating for a hundred people and then there would be a foyer and there was um, a classroom 
and then there was two more classrooms with accordion divider and a little kitchenette off one end and then a men and women's bathroom that was in the building and also uh, all the landscaping was done they laid brick conventional brick on either end that was all done all in that 24 hours yeah yeah so that's the that's the power of uh, well the difference there is you had 300 skilled people correct it was here <coughs> we're saying hey actually anybody can do this because we're paying a lot of attention to those details that's actually what i'm working on right now like we're going to do this finish this build here like next week and it's like wow uh, i want to see this thing get done in five days right now we have the foundation uh, but yeah it takes tremendous detail so i'm doing everything in, in free cad and all that but that's the thing these modules now can apply to any kind of a structure much larger size smaller like 256 square feet this one here is a thousand square feet um, so yeah that's that but yeah the the whole de like like we're developing the technology rigorously the enterprise models have to be developed rigorously and we can change the world by saying hey this is free you can actually do this uh, we'll charge you to get trained you can do this on your own too so there's all kinds of avenues here's the enterprises around it here's the blueprints here's the enterprise blueprints we offer training we offer a turnkey house many different different levels many layers that would take many many more people than us to develop and that's what we'll be working on one of the things we're going to do is uh, an incentive challenge uh, where, where we, we deploy, deploy the actual large, large printer. printer. So, so that's, that's, that's going to be the okay, Now we're getting a thousand people to collaborate from all over the world on a design of this 3D printer that can print from, print from trash materials, materials print from trash. Now we actually got a plastic lumber. lumber. So, so crazy things, things like that. Uh, incentive challenges, hackathons, we're going to include that because nine of us here are not going to do it. So this is much bigger. This takes a team of thousands. And, and you have, have to look, look at, at right, right now, Linux has about 2,000, as far as I know, uh, full-time developers. That's the scale we need to get to. Probably bigger, because hardware is much harder. It's, it's uh, I say it's not a times, it's actually 1,000 times harder. Uh, that's my estimation of how, how harder, how much harder hardware is compared to software. And, and of course, there's historical reasons, reasons why throughout the Industrial Revolution, open has never, never happened in the hardware. So there's huge inertia there, there with the software, the resistance wasn't there. Uh, but, but we've got uh, our work cut out for us. Martin, would you be able to share like the broad strokes of the six months and like the yeah. curriculum? Broad strokes are. are before, before I do that, can I just quickly say yeah. uh, I have a call at noon, so okay. I'm going to jump off, but it's been okay. a pleasure to. To meet you all, and I'm looking forward to working with you. Thank, Thank you, Matt. Right. Thank See you, you soon. And we're recording this so you can review this, this later. later. Thanks. Great. Perfect. So, so yeah. Okay. Katrina will check, check out since I got that headphones out. I look forward to meeting you in person. Broad strokes. Take care. <laughs> so, the first month we arrive, we'll do the uh, basic basic training so we are looking at building the, the small 3d printer the first day uh, first second day like first we dive right in here's how we collaborate here's how we do free cad uh before we all come here definitely try to see if we can do the, the feature on the feature exercise in free cad but we start with that the second week is we get into the workshop and we got to build some infrastructure we're building a large workshop in the uh, before the september before September 1st, we're building a large workshop. So that's going to be the first month. The second week is the CD press build. And after that, building this actual huge workshop with solar panels, so it's completely off-grid cable. It's going to be a combination of compressor, block, and uh, actually some welded trusses. So we get a lot of welding. And that's, that's what we're looking at right now. Uh, but it's, you know, the most inexpensive kind of uh, structure where effectively the walls are it's rebar welded and it makes amazing trusses um, but that combined with compressed earth block a uh, pretty low cost structure i don't know exactly the, the whole price point of that but we're going to build ourselves the machine that does that with the bricks and then we're going to build with it 
Uh, for that, we also need a tractor to move things around. Uh, we've got one tractor here, but we're going to look at in the, in the week that we build the brick press. The brick press is only, once again, we build those things in a day. When we do the workshop on the brick press, one day. That's it. So in that whole week that we have dedicated to getting the brick press going and tested and all that, we're probably going to have time to build the next generation tractor. Because the thing is about block, compressor block, it's not about making the block, really. It's not about really laying the block in the wall. It's about moving, moving those blocks. They're heavy, they're 20 pounds, 10 kilos each. So uh, each four foot leader <coughs> wall section weighs two tons. That's the heavy part. So if you have a tractor to get the pallets of the bricks right to the wall, you're just stacking them right in the wall. So that could be breakthrough. That's like, nobody does this. Like bricks, brick presses, it's just like legacy housing today. We're gonna try to make it so efficient and easy low cost uh, with, with appropriate open source equipment to make this feasible. So we'll do the workshop where that could change history in the sense of, uh, wow, we figured out a way to do this based on all our experience. Like in Belize, the build of this, the microhouse in Belize, we learned that we can lay the bricks super fast. So we're going to capitalize on all that. So the first month is uh, we get the collaborative literacy in place, 3D printer, then the, the tractor brick press. Uh, that week. Now, since we have quite a bit of time in the first week, uh, we're going to try to squeeze the torch table in there, where we build. We've got one here that's partially built, but uh, in the first week where we build the 3D printer, the, the build takes a day, so we can do more uh, effectively experimenting with the larger scale frames of the printer, which if you make it larger, you can make the torch table structure. So the first week is going to be both the printer, in reality, both the printer and the torch table. We have nine of us there. Oh, Arturo, hi. Oh, I can't hear you, but you're also... Missed by now. <laughs> Can't, Can't hear you, so uh, do, do your sound. sound. Looks, Looks like, like um, okay, okay, now, now there, there you are. are. Uh, so we were going, going over the schedule, schedule for the first month, but we'll have you just pipe in a little bit. Um, so, so, so the first month is, so there's the big, big workshop build, there's the build of the torch table printers, brick press work. So after the first month, we build this new workshop. And some now the second month is more infrastructure building, so things like the, there's a small cabins as well as the outdoor kitchen that we're going to be building for the event. But more on the, uh, uh, in terms of the, the machine kind of work is, is getting the filament maker with trash plastic going. So we've done that before, but we're going to take that to the next iteration. So by the second month, hopefully we would have the the plastic recycling infrastructure in place so we can be making cheap film. Because the thing is, like, yeah, you can print plastic lumber right now, but it will cost you, like, $100 <laughs> per stick of lumber. More than that, like, one stick of lumber just give you the real figures. It's about 10 pounds, five rolls of filament. Yeah, it's, it's about exactly a roll of filament is, like, 20 bucks, so it will cost you $100 per stick of lumber. Well, if you have waste plastic, it will cost you, like, uh, under a dollar. To, to do that. In, In fact, fact, we have free plastic, plastic it's, it's only the cost, cost of energy, and that's going to be like 10 cents per stick of lumber. So 10 cents or $100, your, your choice. And, <laughs> and that's uh, kind of Wes addresses your question. Yeah, you need the, the, the things that the money can buy. You can get $100. <laughs> or right now, the stick of lumber like that is a 2 by 6 is 2 by 4 even, is $10 in the store right now we can do 10 cents, let's say. So th that's how this works. It's like a drastic cost reduction. So now, the going back to the schedule, September 1st, that's where the big event comes in with a big house. Um, whole build through in 14 days. And then you can look at the rest of the schedule for the, the summer X, but basically a workshop back to back every week. Um, and us, since we're there on site all the time, we might take breaks as we need to, because it will be kind of intense. Um, but the schedule, the general schedule is that we, even through the summer X, we design in the morning. So from eight to noon, it's design time, and in the afternoon, it's shop time. So twelve, a one to five, shop time. We got get our eight to five, and then in the in the evenings, five thirty to about eight, is um, the enterprise seminar. And wh whoever wants to go for a walk, I go for a walk at eight p.m. every day around the block 
four miles. The block is a square of one mile each. That's how the agricultural blocks here look. So if anyone wants to join me on that, 8 p.m. sharp. Uh, does that kind of answer the general flow of the, the summer or do we miss it? And then the, the December, there's still 22 days left till right up until before Christmas. And at that time it would be like final projects and certification. So we can um, come up with a certification. We kind of have the basic thing, but basically design a module, build a module, which takes about two hours. You can design a full module and we'll teach you how to design a full module, like any module window, door, anything, you will be able to do that in FreeCAD in under two hours per module. And for the build, you'll be able to build any one of them in two hours or less as well. Uh, so if you're very good at this, you'll be able to do that, each of those things in one hour. Uh, normal flow is two hours is the kind of, like, uh, I would say normal. I mean, beginners would take much longer, it would take you multiple times of that before you know it. But, but here the goal is to get into FreeCAD, like uh, just master that workflow that when you think visually, th think of this, you know, you're trying to come up conceptually some, something. Well, you can kind of meditate on it, close your eyes, visualize like athletes, uh, visualize every move or every structure of the build. Or you can do that in CAD uh, because you'll see that uh, your brain can handle only so much. It becomes much more effective if you want to go to more complexity to do it in CAD. So you should get the ability to go, okay, here's an idea and I'm bam, just quickly in CAD. Uh, within seconds per part, you just keep building up that structure one by one. So as long as you can draw things, make them 3D pieces, rotate and move them in 3D, that's all we need. Like that's, that's how the workflow is. It's like to build a tractor, one part, next part, and you just keep building the parts. But you have to understand the, the breakdown down to the parts so you can say, oh, okay, that's how this module looks. And, and the mastery of the whole build, if you talk about the build of the CD home, if you want to actually lead others or actually run workshops, know how to source it, you have to know it at that level. You would have to know between CAD, between the actual build, you have to understand every single step and how um, the basic tools that uh, are to, tools and techniques that are needed to get there. But the thing is that because it's modular and highly redundant at the end of the day, once you start getting the principles of how this works, there's only so many primitive parts that you have to work with. You know, So um, at the end of the six months, on top of the house, we, we'll be doing design lessons on a different topic every single day. It can be turned into more like a course. Here's how you design anything in a buildable way, not just here you're designing stuff. Uh, here's a buildable way because whatever we design we actually know oh yeah you can build this exactly like this we've done it we're building continuously evolving the modules so uh, at the end of the six months the, think of your goal as okay what primitives of technology do I need to understand in order to be able to design just about anything and then you'll say oh, okay I need to understand like lumber bolts electric motors maybe hydraulic motors metal solenoids, uh, screws, plumbing fittings. There's, there's a bunch of primitives. So once you understand how they work and how they're combined together, you'll start to demystify technology to, oh, okay, that's how it works. It's only made of these fundamental parts. And that's, that's how I think, like right now I could say, okay, yeah, let me design anything because I, you know, I delve into these primitive pieces. But the good news is that that's highly teachable. Like once you see the patterns of how everything comes together and you design it, not in a way where, oh, we're going to th throw everything into the, the project. No, we're selecting. We're being very selective and saying, okay, these are the most powerful, important, common parts that we use that get you like 99% of any technology. And, and you'll do very well with that. It's the 80-20 rule with, with um, just 20% of the parts, you can do like 80% of anything. So we, we're definitely very selective. Um, in terms of the techniques we build. Did that kind of answer the question? But Absolutely. So, okay, okay, very cool. So think about it as you're learning a language. It's like learning a language, like programming, like learning Chinese or English. You learn a language, but once you know that language, you can say anything, right? So if you understand the language of hardware, you can build anything. 
It's a completely valid metaphor. Uh, and I will also make a comparison, just last point here, on the comparison of software to hardware, of how hard it is, and why I said that hardware is 1,000 times harder than software. And that is, think about software, how you do it. You have a bug, you fix it, and so forth. You iterate. But you have to do it over and over, and it's like thousands of bugs. And, and the same metaphor must be applied to hardware, too. You do something, you learn how to do it better, iteratively, you can always make things better, but to get to the best products, you gotta fix a lot of bugs, and, a lot, and the bugs are not necessarily bugs, it's all, all the time improvements. Because you can build a machine that works uh, in the first time. You know, we built the brick press or tractor back in, you know, 2009 or so, but we've iterated. You look at the tractor genealogy on our website, there's like 20 builds. And so every, every build uh, improves and that's why it's the hardware is harder because you have a real cost mm -hmm. there's materials there's your intense time so that's why I'm saying it's like a thousand times um, harder that's the kind of mindset you have to think when you do this in order to design and build any technology uh, but then you you start having to think okay if it's like a thousand times harder how do I address that so that's where the the techniques of iterative partial prototyping come into play. Uh, it's called contract first design. There's a lot of tools, first, uh, second Toyota paradox, a lot of different ways where you can prototype iteratively on small parts so you're not building the whole thing and, and trying to make the project manageable. Complex design designed at the level of the smallest parts that are testable. You can use CAD to do a lot of the testing. You can use <coughs> simulations. You can use a lot of different tools. There's a hundred tools you can use to reduce that cost of developing the final product uh, because there's hardware, it's expensive. You know, materials are expensive. Until the point where everything is fully automated and you're just having your robots make all your materials for you and stuff like that. Which, by the way, to me, the, the end point of the house, like this house right here, for example, it's like when I, like my thought process is I was going through the design of the, the modules, I was like, huh, Okay, 3D printing, what about that? Uh, yeah, definitely you could do 3D printing, and then instead of us designing, we, we design the product now, we, we build it with lumber, but eventually it's probably gonna get to like full CNC digital. You know, WikiHouse does digital housing. Here we can talk, well, what about 3D printing to print your entire modules, like, you know, right in this house, all of them. Uh, why not? It's completely doable if you have access to design and low cost materials, 100% doable, not a problem. So I think that's kind of like you always have iterations where you can make things better. And, um, but it takes a, a lot of effort and that's why, to me, it's like we need a team, we need to build a team to, to make this happen. It's not going to happen with who's sitting here, it's going to happen with us sitting here leveraging the whole world by saying this is what's in it for you and it benefits everybody and it's an irresistible offer because we're solving, solving important problems. So that's how it works. Piece of cake. Now, uh, let's hear, okay, Arturo, uh, introduce yourself. We, we all went through, we re are recording this so you can review this, uh, but tell okay. us uh, what, what you think your goals are for the next six months as you join us um, at, on the team. This well, this, yourself, could, yeah. this could be to uh, uh, develop this uh, unified model in language that you have uh, mentioned before. So, um, I, I really interested in, in this, uh, this kind of modularity to um, uh, be able to develop some, some of the machines that you have uh, spoken uh, to us. So yes, this I think um, about this like uh, this uni UML unified model language that we used um, on systems on computational systems. But this is um, the same way, but it's mechanical. It's uh, hardware. Oh, I'm, I'm really interested in this stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Creating a universal language, that's kind of what we're talking about. Language like any other language. So Arturo, he's yeah. from Mexico, he's a mechatronics teacher, so definitely uh, can help a lot in the whole effort. Um, yeah, thank you. And once again, we, we did record this whole thing, so we can blast this through the ethernet. Um, so yeah, we should probably wrap up pretty soon unless people want to stick or stick around. But that's a that's a great introduction to all of us. So we've got some really cool people here. I definitely look forward to learning from all of you. 
Um, anything else we want to bring up at this time? or? I mean, we can keep talking forever here, and, and that's why we, we're going to spend enough time with each other on site and all that. And I'll send you some more prep stuff and before that. Uh, but uh, any any other things we want to bring up here before we wrap up? Thank you. <laughs> Important one. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I'd say... I'd say let's wrap it up here. We'll continue on the internet and you due diligence. Um, picking you up at the airport if you're arriving at the airport. And otherwise, a few people are driving in. And in the meantime, preparing the site. Uh, we are hoping that by the time you arrive, you've got the CD Go Home 2 here standing. If not, we're going to have to finish it off when you arrive here, which wouldn't be a bad exercise either as we probably have most of it done and you can see some of the last steps uh, but yeah there's a lot a lot of work for us and I, I definitely look forward to to meeting you all in person here and throughout this whole time just you know keep spreading the word I think one of the things that emerges from this meeting for me is that yeah like building the number of people that can uh, make the apprenticeship happen scaling this program and imagine like all of you, like say, say you end up in a different place after this six month experience, are you going to be in a place to actually start training others? How far do you want to get? It's really up to you. So it's, it's, it's really about how much you get out of this is really how much, how much energy you focus on it. Uh, so I definitely would, would think about it, you know, give it all the, when you go into the program, give it all the energy that you have. Cause I mean, there's so much content to learn here. We're teaching each other. We have an amazing opportunity. But the good thing is also it's only the beginning. So it's a start. I think we got an amazing crew so far. And I look forward to making it grow. Thanks great, right. Martin. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Great, thank uh, Amazing meeting all of you. Take care, everyone. Uh, oh, oh, all um, right, thanks. I was going to ask about, like, supplementing some of the things I, I know that for building some of these products it's supposed to be you know simple you don't necessarily need to know uh you know some of the, the mechanics or the yeah. fundamental engineering stuff but how important do you think that is for an, an osc developer i mean eventually that that person would have to kind of become familiar with a lot of those concepts right that, that's a very good question and actually the answer is that a developer can come in at various various levels because the endpoint of our development is like the computer metaphor engineers develop the computer now everyone uses it for very creative purposes all kinds of purposes our goal as developers could be either to develop that computer or to develop the applications so once you have the built modules you can go nuts in terms of the kinds of many applications if you want to go to a deeper level to change the functionality of those modules you have to learn at a deeper level now the, right. the design training that we have in um, my goal for that design training is like okay I'll t teach you all that I know like in a rapid fire hose every morning you'll get an hour of that and after six months of that um, and some of it will, will repeat but a lot of it will be like okay here's all I learned in a, you know all my technical training so about 15 years of practical experience and before that you know like 35 years of theoretical experience most primarily um, but the goal is in those six months I would like to transfer my 15 years of learning to you that's that's my promise and with that you'll be able to go far but you do have to go into other tools like okay now understand basic principles like like Musk talks a lot about first principles thinking uh, there is uh, first principles thinking it's kind of like physics thinking that is also like train your mind to think at the fundamental principles so when you approach a problem okay like structural engineering or is this tractor gonna crumble under the weight or is this house gonna stand up or how fast is this machine gonna move you can start taking the very basic principles of physics and applying them um, so that you can have the power 
of uh, deep design in you. I do have good news on that. The good news is that you don't need to be a specific engineer. Like what we're trying to train for is the generalism. The generalists who can take basic principles and apply them to just about anything because you've been exposed and cross-fertilized with multiple disciplines. That's how I think you can learn most effectively. So you don't need to be this structural engineer. You could be a generalist who knows how to use FreeCAD and knows that there is a finite element analysis module and then knows that, oh yeah, you can simu you know, you can actually calculate things. Numeracy is right. a big topic. So if you can count, so like accountants count, uh, engineers are advanced accountants, you know, physical principles on top of counting, but it's, 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 it is counting. Now, fortunately, we've got computers. You don't have to know how to count uh, so much these days. You have to understand like what you're counting, like how that process works. But we've got these amazing tools that can help us on that. So the point is we can be superhuman in our ability to design at a deep level and apply it to very broad problems. So that's just nothing but good news on how that design process works. Does that address the question? Yeah, and then so. Because it, <laughs> I mean, yeah, at some point you're going to have to, you know, maybe you want to make a modification, yeah. but that requires you to understand yep. why the house is built the way it is, and then you can maybe yep. move one of the power modules to another wall or, or something. But for the for the common person. <laughs> 